Hello and welcome to season three, episode 14 of Duelist Community. I am change happening every single moment, never what you think I am and never, especially never what I think I am. Nice. And on that note, I'm just going to say I am not a non-dualist. I had somebody accuse me of that earlier today that I am a non-dual philosophy guy. And it's not even a little bit because I don't think that there's a such thing. If you're dwelling in philosophy, then it's not applicable. But that's the whole point. It's the difference between the concept and the reality. So whatever we are, we are. And the labels are unimportant, which reminds me of our next guest, actually. And I'm very excited to announce him. But before I do that, I just want to make a few announcements about the podcast and some upcoming stuff. Uh, the first announcement, of course, is that we have a, another contest that's happening right now. If you don't already know, all you have to do is go to the website, dualisticunity.com enter the quote contest, you will find the button on the homepage or in the contact section, and then just enter your favorite quote from the Dualistic Unity podcast with the episode name or the episode number so we know where you found that quote, and you will have a chance to win some free Dualistic Unity merch, like a sweater or a t-shirt or a tote bag, could be just about anything. It's a fun contest, it's absolutely free, and all you have to do is listen to the podcast to find the quotes that you enjoy. The second announcement, and this is something that was that was brought up on Discord recently, we would like to encourage everybody out there, if you have a favorite creator, if you have a favorite podcaster, if you have a favorite celebrity, and you would like them to talk to us, the chances of us reaching out to them is pretty slim because we have a lot going on. And in all honesty, we're always looking for new opportunities to kind of branch out and expand the community. But you're out there. So if you're in their comment section or if you're on their website, reach out, drop a comment, tell them to get in touch with Dualistic Unity. Just let them know we're out there because they may not know. And you may be the bridge that we need to bring that person onto the show. So definitely do that. Feel free to invite anyone you like because we're all in this together. And the more we can expand this conversation, the better it's going to become. Last announcement, of course, is the free public group Zoom that is happening this Wednesday, the first Wednesday of every month. We do an hour-long group Zoom that's absolutely free to the public. All you have to do is register at dualisticunity.com, and you can join us for that hour. We talk about just about anything. You can ask a question. You can bring up a subject. You can say anything you'd like, and then we just kind of go around the room and see what everybody's insights are. It's a lot of fun. And that's it for the announcements. And so without wasting any more time, I'm going to get to our guest. Our guest today is Spencer Gale. Uh, Spencer, who you can find on TikTok and Instagram under my two Spence, though uh, on Instagram, it does have an underscore after that. He is a passionate self-improvement creator who discusses the power of the mind. He talks about appreciation for existence itself, and he focuses a lot on the danger of attaching to labels and a lot more. There is a lot in this man's content and is definitely worth a watch. If you haven't already run across him on TikTok, it's only a matter of time considering the fire that seems to burn within him. So I'm gonna ask you, Spencer, just to say a little bit about yourself. And more importantly, and this is the thing that I really wanna know, where does that fire come from? What brought you to be so passionate about this path? I'm very curious to know and welcome. Thank you. Um, I guess what brought this, I mean, it's a long story. Um, but I'll try to keep it as concise as I can to save time. I've been, uh, I guess you could say, struggling with mental health throughout the years and um, just just in and out of a few psych hospitals and just family issues and all sorts of all sorts of crap. The last year, 2021, I, um, I started a TikTok account. And the reason being is because I'd always wanted to create content and I just never really got a chance. I wasn't allowed to create content back home. Um, but now that I, I live in a different place uh, where the rules are different, I can now create content. And so, yeah, I started creating content of um, basically quotes of David Goggins. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with him. He's a Navy SEAL, just uh, makes a bunch of motivational videos online and that sort of thing. And, you know, I, I didn't do anything crazy. I literally just repeated his quotes word for word and I just recorded myself in the mirror saying them and uh, as time went on I started noticing people uh, engaging with my videos and I was like oh this is pretty cool and this was in uh, November 2021 and um, eventually in like February it started to started to take off and um, yeah I was still making motivational videos at that time and what 
was really great at that time is <laughs> when my account started taking off is when I had, I guess, what you could call an existential crisis. And what happened when I had this existential crisis is I started to question everything. Like, for instance, why I was going to school every day, why I was going to a building for eight hours a day to learn something I didn't care about, and why I even existed at all. And so I started asking everybody, and um, I got one of two answers. I don't know, or to fulfill God's plan, neither of which really suited my fancy. So I kept questioning, I kept questioning, and um, at one point, I stopped going to school. This was in the middle of my junior year. And um, yeah, I just went full blown. <laughs> I guess what you could say, uh, I don't know how to describe it. I, I just didn't do much every day. I was very inactive and I just continued to question. And at that, at that time, I, my account was also starting to blow up, uh, my TikTok account. And at that time, I also changed my account name because I wanted to be more true to me. And um, I changed it from David Goggins Jr. to My Two Spence because I wanted to be my own thing and not me saying something that someone else said. And so I'm and I don't know if you get the joke, My Two Spence, like My Two Cents, kind of funny, right? <laughs> I don't know how many people get that the look at my account, but I think it's I think it's pretty nice. And so yeah, my account started to blow up, and at the same time, I had my first existential crisis. And from there, I continued to question. Um, working my minimum wage job, and that was pretty much it. I worked the job, and I came home. I did nothing except, I don't know, just kind of scroll and try to figure out life. And at one point, I found you guys' podcast. <laughs> I don't know how I stumbled upon it, but um, there, there, there couldn't have been anything better to find on this journey. When I stumbled upon y'all's podcast, at the day I quit my job, um, the day I quit my job, I went home and I was sitting in the shower at like 10 o'clock at night. And I was like, I got to do something with my life. And so I did is I was like, I'm going to run a marathon out of nowhere. Um, <laughs> as you guys can see, it's probably a very extravagant story, but um, as, I'll continue. Anyways, I, I, I just literally threw on my running shoes and started running. And I was like, okay, I got to do something while I run. So why don't I listen to this podcast that I've been looking into for um, a week now and I started listening to it and I think I binged three episodes during that entire run I only made it halfway I was not uh trained at all for the marathon <laughs> I was not uh in any way shape or form fit enough or having a, had enough stamina so I uh ended up failing but at least I made it halfway I've never done that before and so I continued listening listening to the podcast while also working working my second job and there was one point in my second job it was a window washing job where I, I remember i was sitting in this where i was not sitting i was standing washing this window in this warehouse for uh this this cleaning company and i hear you guys talk about how everything is god and it took a top it took a couple of times for it to click <laughs> but at one moment i just dropped the squeegee and i was like wow everything is god <laughs> What, 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 have been, what have I been searching for? And so I guess that's what you could call my first spiritual awakening. And so from there forward, I, I don't know. Life just got, life just started going uphill. And I continued to listen to y'all's podcast. And, and I also found this book called The Untethered Soul, which um, kind of goes over some of the same, same things you guys talk about. I don't know if you guys have read that. Um, and yeah, from there forward, I mean, this was only at the beginning of this year. So this, uh, awakening i guess you could call it that i've had hasn't only been for less than six months now so yeah that's kind of my story in a nutshell <laughs> that is that is intense man that is fucking awesome there's so many cool parts to it that we'll absolutely dive into in this episode but yeah i'm i'm very i resonate a lot with the shift that you had content wise going from david goggins jr to my two spence i think there was like there's a very symbolic shift with that with a sort of awakening of like sort of almost going from like mask to maskless or you know there's so many different uh things you can relate that to and in, in terms of progressing and and sort of shifting not into anything but just like shedding more so. And I had a very similar sort of route with content. Like a lot of my early stuff was 
things I had read, things I had learned, quotes that I really enjoyed. It was it was stuff like that. And since then it's shifted to more, I don't know, like like giving advice. And then even like very recently, it's been more just like sharing myself, like not even necessarily like with hints of advice in it, just based on showing my experience as opposed to talking about it or talking about something else that I've experienced through it. And there's just so many different shifts that are made throughout the content creation process, especially when you're like, I would say the two of us are much more similar in the sense that we're like super early on in the path as, as opposed to Ray is like a little more refined with things, I guess. So it's, it's cool to kind of be going through it while so much shit is changing. Like going back to my videos, even a little over a year ago, were significantly different than they are now. They're significantly different now than they were even a few months ago. And I can't even recognize the person that was posting when I first started. Like it's a completely different person. So it's, it's cool to be able to look back as much as people will, sometimes people will go back and like delete old videos that they don't necessarily align with anymore. And I haven't done that. I've kept all of them. Cause I, I almost prefer people to see that there, I had a path to, it wasn't like I always knew any of these things. So with your journey with, with content, is that sort of what you've seen as the shift from, you know, even literally like the David Goggins Jr. to my two Spence is less so trying to be something and more so just allowing things to be as they are and recognizing like, you know, the whole idea with enlightenment, like before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water after enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. And it's like, you're not actually doing many different things. Your mentality is just so different that everything is different, but the actions being taken aren't necessarily that different, maybe from the outside, but have you felt that sort of significant shift in terms of just how you approach things and, and less so trying to be something and more so just being period. <laughs> Definitely. That's um, probably the biggest thing that's um, changed my life this year is to stop trying to be something and just to be because trying to be something to try and implies a future. You're trying to be this something in the future. And that's almost the problem with the quote, try uh, be yourself. It's almost like, in, in trying to not in trying to be yourself, you're actually not being yourself or you're, I guess, well, you're still yourself, but it's almost a double mirror. Like when trying to be yourself, you actually make yourself more stressed than if you just, I don't know, just let yourself exist and, and be. So, yeah, I, I found that in my content. Definitely. It's um, and <clears throat> I've noticed my uh, videos ring off the tongue easier when I'm not trying to say someone's quote or say someone else's ideals, um, but more so the mix of all the ideals I've heard. That's absolutely fair. One thing I, I have found is that you're getting this really early. And I just want to mention to the listener that Spencer is 17. That's all. He's 17 years old and he's already where he is in this journey, which is impressive on its own. But one thing I've noticed in your videos recently is that you seem to be catching on to the fact that when you try, there is resistance. There is effort. It's in letting go and relaxing and letting the process unfold that you actually find your stride. You actually find your, your, your own form of expression. I've noticed that more and more in your videos where you are just expressing it in your own words. I particularly like the videos where you say, I made a quote and I've never thought of it that way because I never really take anything I, I say seriously, but that's what we're doing all the time. If we just look back at some of the stuff we say and put quotes around it, we're like, I made a sweet quote there. And I love the fact that you're doing that because you're taking ownership of it. Not ownership like it's my quote, but ownership like I made that. I worked for that. That's the result of all the stuff I've been through. And that's really important. I, I think more people should look at it that way because often, and, and you'll talk to these people all the time, they will quote verbatim from books and, and history and everything else, but it's not in their words. And because of that, there's always this, this tendency to look up to the person who said it instead of recognizing that it's you saying it through them. And so I, I find it so interesting to watch your journey and more importantly, watch how you just relax into it 
my God, man, if I could relax like that at 17 years old, Jesus, I'd probably still have hair. Thanks so much. I, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very important to relax into it and not to try to force it. And I wanted to touch on one thing you said about kind of looking up to the people, the philosophers that have said these things and repeating their quotes as if there's some grandiose person. Um, and I've almost had to make sure not to, because I, I kind of, I guess you could consider you guys, uh, look, look up to you guys in a way. I've, I've, I've had to make sure not to look up to the guys that are telling me not to look up to them. <laughs> and telling me the exact problem is that you're looking up to the person. And so, <laughs> and so I, I've made sure to keep that in practice. And um, obviously I'm kind of failing at it because you, you guys probably could tell I'm, I'm very nervous to be on here. And it's because I look up to you guys, look up to you guys. So, um, yeah. And I think it's important to look up to yourself as much as everyone else and not to look down on other people and not to look in directions, just look at them and not with any judgment. So it's definitely important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. And I just want to mention, you're doing great, by the way, because even before the conversation with you, I felt a surge of energy. I absolutely felt a drawing to the moment because you're an intelligent person. If I don't bring my A game, I mean, I could slip. The whole episode could go to shit, right? I mean, it's all natural thought. It's all natural thought. But unless you you go, that's a valid reason to be afraid, then it's just energy. It's just what brings you closer to the moment, right? And as long as you don't resist it, it, it offers opportunities. And so I just want to say, you're doing fantastic, man. And I'm glad that you got the point that we've been trying to drill into everybody's head that we don't want you looking up to us because that makes it harder for us to relate to you. And we want to relate to you because then we learn from you as well as you learning from us. It becomes more of, a, of an action of unity than anything else, which is ultimately what this is all about. I'm going to pass it over to Andrew now because I know I just swept right in there. You're good. Yeah, no, Spencer, you're you're crushing it so far, dude. And, and especially at your age, like, holy shit, 10 years ago, like I'm 27 now, 10 years ago, like I wasn't anywhere close i i've only been posting for two years since i was 25 was when i started talking about all this stuff so you got some fucking runway man so you're you're crushing it even the ability to you know come on a podcast like this like i would have said no i wouldn't have even tried so the fact that you're here is is dope but even you know even sharing that and i've talked about this a few times but sharing the idea of of being nervous and that's that's potentially the most beneficial thing that someone on here will get from this, like you explaining that you were nervous and you're still on here and you're still talking, you're still doing a great job. You're still expressing yourself. You're still able to express these ideas and, and share your story and do all these things, despite whatever internal feelings that you're feeling, because everyone feels those things. And the only difference between anyone is whether or not it lets them, they let it stop them because it's always going to be there to a degree. It gets quieter, I would say, the more the more things you do, the more actions you take, you know, but it's this is it. like that's the path, the decision to come on here and, and be OK with coming on here and sharing yourself no matter how you feel like that's it right there. Like that's that's the game. Like you're you already won by deciding to come on here. So and I, I still feel those ways like I've done tons of guest appearances on podcasts, tons of our own podcasts, and I still will get like pangs of nerves. And in fact, I, I like when I do, because there have been times where I'm like not nervous at all. And it's, it's like, I'm almost a little too lackadaisical going on to something. And then it's like, I get caught off guard and there's, there's like a, like Ray was saying, a sort of energy that comes with, with a couple nerves, a couple butterflies in there that kind of focuses you into the experience so we think of nerves as something like oh I, I wish i could just never get nervous and it's like there's there's some benefits to it and i'll be the first to admit that and, and talk about it and and i've derived a lot of benefit and in fact usually i i perform significantly better when there are some nerves as opposed to not being nervous at all and uh, you know eventually they subside the more you go through the situation but yeah, nervousness is not something to uh, that I fear as much anymore. It's more 
I'm almost appreciative of it. And it's, you know, they always say, no, it's no different than excitement. It's the same feeling. It's your thoughts about it that differ. And yeah, I'm sure that's true. But at the same time, those thoughts are still there and, and being able to look them in the face and say, fuck you, I'm going to do this anyway. Like you don't have that power over me. It's like, now you have the power. And now there's a huge shift in that. And the more you do it, like, you know, the easier it gets every single time, but you, you got to go through those first couple of times in order to improve and be able to articulate things the way that you want. It's always refining. It's a self-refining process that's always happening. And all you got to do is keep doing, which is what you're doing. So yeah, props to you, man. Yeah, absolutely. And so I'm going to drop the mood a little bit. Sorry. Um, I want to, I want to talk specifically about one of your videos and this kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier. And, you know, where's your passion come from? Where, where does this drive come from? And I can only assume that you had a period of your life, probably in the last three years, that shit got real dark and, and that you felt, you felt isolated and you, you felt confused and you were trying to figure things out and you more or less had to start from the ground up. And, and that's where a lot of us find that empathy. That's where a lot of us find that drive. We go through hell, we come out the other side and we go, Jesus, I, I'm going to help anybody I can to avoid that shit because it's terrible. Is that, would, would you say that's about what you went through without getting into the gory details of everything that, that you've experienced? Would you say that it's empathy and the experience itself that drives you to continue to make this content? Because the video I'm referring to specifically is one where you had a direct message from somebody who you had spoken to before. And that message ended up coming from their parents because that person ended up taking their own life. And I get messages like that, not like that, but I have had messages like that in the past, but I get messages from people who are on the brink rather frequently. And I get messages from people who are trying to sort through this stuff rather frequently. And I know I go out of my way to interact with them because I remember being there. I remember what it's like to not feel like there's a way out and for that to be almost crushing just that that perception that there was nothing else but the hell that you're in do you find that that that's what drives you i don't know anything about your history and so i'm so curious at 17 for you to have met, to have found this clarity and this empathy it's incredible man um that's definitely the biggest thing there's 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 pretty much nothing else um i know you said not to get into the gory details uh so i guess i'll have to beat around the bush a bit you are but, uh, welcome to if you'd like to i just didn't want to put any pressure on you to do so oh no i don't mind i will share everything and everything because anything that i don't share is an insecurity in my opinion so um yeah <clears throat> in 2020 uh i uh yeah I, I got admitted into i think three psych hospitals and at this time i was 15 and i didn't think i was what you could call like out of it. I, I wasn't like crazy. I guess you could label me as that, but, um, I, I got admitted into these places and I, um, stayed in from psych hospital to residential treatment center for a total of like eight months, uh, in that year. So I spent eight months out of 2021 and 2020 in those places and was around many people who, yeah, they wanted to do that. They wanted to, um, uh, yeah, they wanted to off themselves. So, um, and there was, even, yeah, the, I won't go too deep into that, but there were some people who tried. Um, and so, but I, um, yeah, I came out of that and that, that's, that was probably the biggest motivator. After that, I almost wanted to prove, I guess, my, the therapists I had and they're wrong. And I was like, I'm going to become my own therapist. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into psychology myself. I'm going to go get a psychology degree myself and prove that I'm not crazy. <laughs> and I never was. And that I didn't need to go there. And, but you, you have no choices of mine. So I, I, it's not like I could just up and leave. Um, and it's not like I could choose to even go there in the first place. So I think that was probably the biggest lesson I had in my life was going to those places. And I came out of there. Um, and I, when I came out of there, I was, I moved to a new city in Chicago and I was living with my aunt and, um, yeah, that's basically when I started my account and it was to help people who were in similar situations to me, who, um, felt like they didn't have anyone they could relate to 
and specifically teenagers, because um, in my opinion, I feel like teenagers can feel like some of the most trapped individuals in the world, because unlike children, you know, children are kind of less, they don't care as much about being entrapped and adults don't have as many laws around them. And so the age of 13 to 17 is probably the most entrapped uh, an, an, an individual can feel. And so, yeah, that, that was kind of my mission. I wanted to kind of start my own place at some point. I wanted to set a goal to start my own place where kids could actually go to uh, learn, like, I don't know, actually heal <laughs> and not just basically sit around all day because that's pretty much all we did. Uh, and so, and so I wanted to start a place like that to, to actually help kids and, and prevent them from, uh, taking that sort of action. And I like how you mentioned that video because that video was, there was a very important part of that video that I want to make very clear. Um, I said like, basically how I'm not upset that he killed himself. I'm upset that he had, he felt like he had to escape. It's not the actual action that I was upset about. It was that his mind was so, he, he was so like, he felt like he was so entrapped to the point where he felt like he had to do something like that. Um, and that's kind of what I want to help people realize, kind of like you guys are doing, is that the situation isn't the problem. You guys repeat this quote all the time. It's your thoughts about it. And you can go through anything. You can, I mean, I don't know if you guys have read the book, um, A Man's Search for Meaning. It's a pretty good book about a man who, uh, <clears throat> he was around during World War II and he went through four Nazi camps. And I haven't actually finished it, just got to be honest, be real here. <laughs> but from what I can tell from the book, um, it sounds like he found a purpose for living and found happiness in one of the darkest places a human can imagine, a concentration camp. It's, it's really possible. And I don't know. That's exactly where I got the motivation from, Ray. So, yeah. That's beautiful, man. I just want to say quickly, I'll pass it off to Andrew here in a second. I just want to say you're an inspiration. And, and it is very much the point that, well, it's very much the reason I wanted to talk to you because I remember going through the teenage years. So that was the darkest part, part of my life. And you're right. As a child, although you go through trauma, there's almost this lack of awareness that it is trauma because it's all you know. But when you start waking up to the world and you start getting an idea of yourself compared to everyone else, basically you become a teenager. All of a sudden you wake up to the fact that things aren't supposed to be like this. This doesn't seem right. And you start to have opinions about that. And then of course the environment that you're in doesn't like the fact that you're questioning it and it gets much worse from there. And so I had this conversation with somebody recently uh, about misery in the world, people in poverty, people starving, things like that. Like, you know, oh yeah, you know, being balanced, seeing everything as one isn't going to solve that. It's like it is because it changes the environment. The environment that we grew up in was, was filled with people who didn't know they were us. That's why they treated us the way they did. That's why we were raised the way we were. So making these ripples coming out of that, that, that furnace, as it were, as a, as a finished piece of steel and going into the world and being, and being purposeful and what you do with all of that skill that you learned through going through that experience, that, that's the path, man. That's exactly what this is about. You're early on it, but I'm glad you're here. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you sharing all of that because that's these are the kind of conversations we want to be having, like the, the honest, the open, the ones where we do get vulnerable. And it's so obvious where all of your intensity comes from and, and how passionate you are and, and how much it comes through in your videos, those, those feelings, like it really is a, you know, like people, like a vibe, that sort of thing, but it, it is, it's a certain energy that you bring and, and intensity. And, and so I can definitely tell, and I'm sure that tons of other people can tell. That's why so many people follow you is because that rings through. There's lots of people saying similar types of things, but it's, it's clear that it's, through your experience that you're feeling that. And it's fascinating how often the people who really have powerful messages and, and people resonate a lot with how often it's, it's just through them going through the shit 
And so people, you know, we talked about this, uh, I don't know, maybe it was 10 episodes ago or so about the idea of trauma and, and how it's, everyone thinks of it as a, an objectively bad thing. And it's not to say that I would, I would say it's a good thing, but it is what it is. And everyone has an opportunity to do with it what they will kind of similar to the situation that someone is in. It's not to say that there, there are different levels to the situations people are born into and experience throughout their lives, but it doesn't mean that there isn't something you can do with it. It's the same with, you know, certain body types. Like some people are born a certain way. Some people are born a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. And it's not to say that you're subjected to that. You may not be able to get to a certain point that someone else can because of their, you know, genetic predisposition, but you're able to do something. And that's, I think what a lot of people forget is it's not about someone else and, and what they're doing. It's about what you're doing. You know, what you did yesterday, what you're doing now, what, what you can work on within yourself and not even, you know, there's nothing to improve on, but that you have to do, but because you can do it. And so I think it's really cool. And I really enjoy talking to people who have been through things and are willing to be open and, and vulnerable about it because I know Ray is in the same boat and I'm in the same boat. I, I think maybe not to the as intense of a degree, but again, you can't compare pain. You can't compare suffering. So I went through my own sorts of things and that's the only reason that I share stuff. Like if I hadn't gone through those things, and had never experienced those things, the, the suffering that I went to, to the degree that I did, I wouldn't have started talking about it. I wouldn't have started sharing. I wouldn't have taken the responsibility upon myself to actually work on some shit, try and figure out if I can get over this and, and overcome it in a way. And once I started to, I was like, all right, well, that was really shitty going through those years, but I feel a lot better now. So maybe, you know, someone else will resonate if I start posting stuff about it. And that was it. It's just sharing things that I've learned, sharing things that have helped me because I went through my own little period of hell and, and I know what it's like. And, and so that's so often what it comes down to for everyone, I think, is, is just sharing your story and and being open and authentic and, and vulnerable about it because that's what connects us if everyone's going around you know not being vulnerable at all not sharing anything trying to be this thing for the world to prove themselves like that's not doing anyone any good <laughs> like you're only creating more suffering for yourself because you're resisting the way that you are but then you're also not even helping anyone. People are just comparing themselves to this idea, this concept of you. And so that vulnerability is so, so important. And so I guess to, to get, give you another question, Spencer, with, with this, where, where was the shift, I guess, into being more open with your own experiences. I feel like that sort of shift, like I was talking about before, the name shift of your accounts is very symbolic. And, and it seems like there was a sort of shift to sharing your experience as opposed to maybe just someone else's words that, that helped you. Was there a specific sort of moment that you experienced or a number of moments or, or any, anything, I guess, that's more impactful that you can think of looking back on that you maybe remember that you keep in mind. I know I probably have like a handful of things that I can remember over the last five years that have been like really impactful shifts. Do you have any moments or experiences or, or groups of experiences like that? I think that was probably the biggest one. I mean, between that aha moment, <laughs> that aha moment, and now there's been several, um, such as when I finished uh, the book I told you, I don't know if uh, I was telling you guys about earlier, The Untethered Soul. Um, when I was going through that book, I heard a chapter. There was a specific quote in, the in, in that book that really kind of clicked in my mind. And I started to take everything less serious. And the quote that he said in that book was basically describing how to become aware of your awareness. Um, and the way he described it was, or my interpretation of how he described it was, imagine yourself 
in almost a VR video game. You're playing a regular video game, right? And then the staff members, they bring out a set of headphones, right? And these are the most adaptive surround sound headphones in the world. And so every which way you move your head, the headphones adjust to it, right? And then you have the VR, go the VR goggles that are super like high definition and it looks super real and you can't even see the goggles or anything. It looks like real life. And then you add the taste receptors. And so now the person in the video game, you can taste the same food they're tasting. You can smell this, the pizza. You can smell everything that the character eats and drinks and everything else, nature, whatever. And then after that, after all those senses are fulfilled, after uh, touch is fulfilled by uh, putting on a machine that um, touches certain parts of your body to make you feel like you're moving, then you add the emotions. Now you feel the same emotions as the character in the movie. Now you feel the same emotions of uh, nervousness that the character feels when he see when he tries to ask out that girl. And so now you can't even tell you're playing the video game. Now you're so in, enroped in it to the point where you can't even tell you're playing it. And then the next thing he said was where I was like, oh my gosh. He said, and you don't know if that's your reality right now. <laughs> You don't know if everything, every, every five cents, all your emotions, all your thoughts are literally just a video game. And so I was listening to that book on Audible uh, on my way back home and I was riding the bike and I just kind of like looked at my life. It's, it's undescribable, the feeling of becoming aware of your awareness. I'm sure you guys know what it feels like, um, but you don't even feel like it's your body. And it's, it's your bike and it's your, your neighborhood that you're riding through. You don't feel like a sense of ownership to anything. And it's almost freeing. And yeah, that, that was kind of the other aha moments that I had in between the first one and now. That's fantastic. You had mentioned something when you're, you're like, well, we weren't going to get into the gory details, but I don't mind opening up about it. And the reason you gave was because if I'm hiding it, there's an insecurity there. I really enjoyed how you said that because that's very much the point is that there is a point where you start to realize oh, if I'm hiding this, I'm still defining myself by it. If I'm, if I'm tucking it away from people, I'm still afraid of it. And I think that's what Andrew was trying to get at when he was asking, where's that transition? Because I know for me, there was a point where I didn't want to tell people about my life because I thought they'd judge me for it. I didn't want to tell people about the insecurities I faced. I didn't even want to tell people about my, my successes, you know, and in the same way that I've had people come in for life coaching when I used to have an office and they would go up to the front desk because I worked in a health center and they would almost like shyly and, and they'd look around as they took a business card of mine and like tucked it in their pocket because they were afraid of somebody judging them for going to a life coach. They were afraid of the stigma of mental health. And so for you to be able to go, no, that's all useful information. I don't need to hide from that. That's a big step. That's a big step. And it does make you uh, more efficient as a speaker. It does make you more effective as somebody who is talking about self-improvement, as somebody who is talking about personal growth. And so I'm going to assume that that was around the same time as you switched to my two spents, because just as Andrew was saying about the symbolism and authenticity, that is also a layer of authenticity. Do you think that's around the same time that you started figuring out, like, I can use my pain? letting people know I was in pain is in fact helpful. Definitely. Um, I think I don't, I think the, my two spins thing, changing my username to that, um, was kind of almost a cherry on top. It was like, I, it wasn't like a pinnacle moment. Definitely. It was just kind of nice to have it felt more, uh, authentic to have my name there. Cause a lot of people thought my name was David. <laughs> A lot of people were in my comments like, oh, dude, I like your videos, David. And I'm like, I'm not David, <laughs> but I'm saying the words of David. And so <laughs> it was definitely that, that, that kind of prompted me to change my name to that. Um, uh, but I, I think that that wasn't like a, definitely a pinnacle moment in my authenticity. Um, I, I, I'd say I'm still working on my authenticity, honestly. It's, it's still a work in progress. Um, I, I still probably need to wane off of being like a life, a life coach, almost advice giver and more so just having conversations with people and, 
uh, letting them take and bite and chew whatever they want. It's still a work in progress, but I like how you highlighted that. It is a work in progress. It will be for a very, very long time. And I'll give you an example, actually, from my own life. So when I was when I first came out of the the forest on Vancouver Island after eight months of, of just self-reflection, uh, I started an account on YouTube and it was called the Journal of a Forgetful God. And so my account name was Forgetful God, which goes to show you where my my mentality was at the time, though I recognized we were all God. I was God. Whereas now my username is transcending me. So you can see the difference in intention. You can see the difference in perspective. One was, look how much I am. The other one is, there is no me. I'm letting that go, right? It's the same point, but it's from a different direction. And so the same is going to happen with you over time. My two spence is incredibly clever. I love, I love the username, but at some point, you may think of something else. You may think of something that, that describes your next mentality even better. So the trick is always to find whatever it is that resonates with you, but to never hold on to that, to never say, okay, this is it now. I'm never going to change that because so many people do. They're like, this was the best idea I've ever had. And they cling to it and it blocks them from having all the other best ideas they'd ever have. Right. So I think it's so interesting that it is a journey and it's one that, that's going to unfold in front of you for years and years and years. And I say this 26 years older than you. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun process too, is something that I want to highlight because I'm absolutely in the thick of it as well. Like I even, it's funny, the symbolism with the name shifts and stuff. Like when I first started on TikTok, I made my name Randy Dufresne. That was my, for the first, I don't know, three months, Randy is like a drunk alter, alter ego that I have. And then Dufresne is from Shawshank Redemption, um, Andy Dufresne. And so that, uh, that was just like a nickname. Everyone in college called me Andy. So uh, yeah, that's where Dufresne, similar to Renane came from. So that I just used that because I was like, I don't want anyone finding out I have a TikTok and then started to gain some followers. And I was like, all right, I should probably, after a couple of months, I was like, all right, I should probably shift it back to my regular name and like back to Andrew. And then since then it's become not Andrew Renane. And it's, it's very specifically because I'm not, but you know, it's convenient, like you said before. And, and it's like the shifts, there's so many constant shifts. And it's funny thinking back to when I was a little younger, I think maybe five years ago or four, three, three or four years ago, when I started getting into spirituality, meditation, all that stuff, like positivity affirmations, I remember there was a day and I literally thought like, oh, I figured it out. I figured it all out. Like I just, and it was very hung up on like being grateful for things. And I, cause it, it felt so good. And, and I was feeling great for, for a while. And there was very little fear, very little worry ever. And eventually, you know, more shit started to come up, but I can very clearly remember thinking like, oh my God, I figured it out. Like I got it. I got it. And I don't think I've felt that way since like i don't think i've ever gotten that like fucking egotistically high um despite getting so much deeper into things so much deeper and now it's like there there's obviously ebbs and flows and everything but there's i know that i don't get it and everything's constantly shifting and i i let go even you know with the content stuff i'll get hung up like i'll go through like phases almost. And I had a phase, there was a point, I think it was like four months that I started literally every video with what if I told you, and then would like say some sort of advice thing or whatever, some like helpful little bit. And then I started to feel a little bit trapped by that. And I was trying to figure out how to fit a video into the, what if I told you thing. And then I, I took like two weeks off TikTok. This was, I don't know, like a year and a half ago. And then when I came back, I was like, I'm done with that shit. <laughs> I'm, I'm done boxing myself up. And then I'll get caught up in, in another box and let that go and another box and let that go. And every time there's like more freedom that comes with it, but it's like sharing that process and deciding to be vulnerable. And, and you even mentioning now, like you're, you still have more to work on and you know that like even just sharing that is it 
Like that's it right there saying like, I know there's still more shit for me to let go of. And, and even for myself, you know, again, resonate with that a lot because I know there's still things that I'm holding on to that I'm not ready. I'm not quite comfortable <laughs> letting go of, but I know that in order to, you know, go even deeper, I have to let go of it. But it's almost like you, you don't want to do everything too quick. Like there's, there's a process of it happening because it can be so turbulent. Just this, this path in and of itself is turbulent, especially in the world we live in. If you were to let go of, of like 10 layers at once, you might be flip turned upside down, like getting checked into, you know, somewhere. And because it's just such a, so far from the typical mentality, it almost helps to sort of make it a process, I guess, like let go of things as you are ready to. And it, it's like, it happens naturally. You don't have to think so much about letting go of it. Like it's always self-refining. And if you're just following that intuition that you have sort of your, your truth, what you feel comfortable with doing in the moment and sharing what you want to share for the sake of sharing it and letting go of, of the judgments of yourself, letting go of, of the, the ideas that you want things to, to move quicker than they are. It's like they're happening, happening perfectly. And, and this is just, again, reminders to myself as well, because it's like every few months, there's like another sort of layer that gets peeled back. But the more it happens, the more I'm like, this is the good shit. Like, this is, this is the fun part, this process of it unfolding and being it and being able to see it without it being so goddamn personal anymore is the fun stuff. So I've, I've let go a lot of even where I think things should be, cause I don't know where they're going to be in a few months or a few years. And there's no possible way for me to even anticipate it whatsoever. And I think that's in life in general, but especially as a content creator and sharing things out there into the ether is like, there's no ceiling to it. Just keep doing it and things are going to keep happening. And if you're along for the ride, it's usually a fun one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So now that I dropped the mood towards, you know, suicide ideation and dealing with depression and all that other stuff, I'm going to pick the mood back up now because what we're talking about now is what do we do with all of these lessons? How do we, un, how do we distill them? How do we refine them? How do we get a better look at them? And ultimately the answer here, the answer there is to jump in, to do stuff, to try things, right? To go out on, uh, go on adventures and, and throw caution to the wind, to accept risk as it were. And so I want to bring up next that Spencer has a new project and it's exciting because there's so much that that project could lead to in terms of experience and adventure. And I'm specifically talking, Spencer, about your school bus. I love the fact that you bought a school bus and that you're planning on, on doing stuff with it. That's fantastic. I would love to know, and I'm not asking for like goals because we, we only have directions. What inspired you to buy a school bus? Okay, th so there's a couple of things that uh, I wanted to touch on that Andrew said, so I'll touch on that later. But what inspired me to get this school bus um was just a content creator i found his name is uh theo goff um i found him <clears throat> in december of last year and i found him by looking up on youtube how to start van life um it, it was something i thought would be cool it wasn't something i thought i'd really get into nothing crazy um but essentially i uh looked more into it and i found a video how to renovate a school bus for one thousand two hundred dollars I was like, what? <laughs> no way. And so I uh, watched this video. I was like, okay, I'm going to buy a school bus. So <laughs> I, I guess I started what you could call manifesting it. And I kept repeating over and over and over again, I'm going to get a school bus to my friends, to my family, to my teachers, to the neighbor, to the cat, everyone. And I continued saying I was going to buy this school bus and I was going to live in it. And everyone was like, okay. No, no mortgage. And my dream job is to be an influencer. So it doesn't matter where I am. I can still work my job and, and I can go to beautiful places like uh, Washington, 
States or I don't know, maybe Vancouver Island or maybe New York or just anywhere. And I can be anywhere. And I don't have to be tethered to one single location. So um, eventually I just, I just kept saying it. I kept saying it. And through that whole time, I had my dropping out of school, existential crisis, all that stuff. And I, I still kept saying, you know, I'm going to get this bus. And in the middle of this summer, uh, my dad and I went down, uh, down, found a, uh, or I found the school bus on Facebook Marketplace. And I drove downtown to where it was. And I was like, okay, I'm going to get it. I, I'm, I'm going to get it because I don't know when else I'm going to take this chance. So I bought it, rattled it all the way back home. And yeah, here it is. It's been sitting in this uh, RV park for the past two months now, uh, just working on renovating it. And the goal is to take all the seats out and make it my own little crib and not have to take the traditional route that costs tons of money and will force me to work a job I do not like. So that is, it's, it's definitely a big part. And I'm glad you asked about that, Ray. It's, it's definitely a big part of my journey um, buying this bus. So, yeah. Oh, it's super exciting. And it's perfect for where you are in your journey, in my humble opinion, at least, because when I was a bit older than you, as I said, I just needed to get out. I needed to be free of society and expectations and the job and people and everything. I just needed to be away. And so I went to the forest and built a shack out of scrap wood that I found and some old shipping bags that I was like stapling onto the inside to act as a barrier from the wind. It was insane. It was, it was really rough in it as it were. And I can't tell you, man, how often I'm sure I would have been totally much warmer and much more comfortable had I had a bus. So I think that it's fantastic that you have that bus. It's still going to be roughing it to some degree. It's not like it's the lap of luxury traveling around in a bus, but it's certainly better than building a, a shack out of scrap wood. So I'm stoked for you, man, because like I said earlier, it's embracing the change now. It's embracing the adventure. It's doing as much as you can while you can, because 17 to say, I don't know, 40, take advantage of it. Don't be establishing roots unless they find you, right? But just enjoy your life because all of that experience is what you're going to have to draw on later when you do have more moments of contemplation, when you do have more moments of reflection, or you just don't feel like running around because your hips hurt, that kind of thing, right? So it's important to get out there and experience things while you can. So I'm stoked for you, man. You're, you're really early on this journey. Like it's great that you're 17 and already here. There's so much potential ahead of you. I'm going to pass it back to Andrew before I get too excited, but I'm stoked for you, buddy. Yeah. Likewise. No echo everything Ray said. It's, it's super exciting to be, to see how clearly you get it at such a young age and to be doing shit with it and not just like, Oh, fuck this shit i'm stuck in this society and all this bullshit and like to actually be making moves is exciting to see to say the least and to be sharing it and having platforms to actually share it on too it's like the perfect storm of everything going on and like you're gonna absolutely make waves with it and there's like i was saying before there's no telling where it's gonna take you if you just keep doing shit keep sharing shit keep making videos keep expressing yourself and that's really all it ever comes down to is just keep doing that and it it figures it out on its own like it's it's that's the best part is that there isn't anywhere we have to get to it's it's so fun to uh to recognize that but yeah with the uh with the school bus what was the school bus just something that you came across specifically when you were looking into van stuff or was there something about a school bus that uh that you kind of liked about it was it like not being at school and living in a school bus sort of thing <laughs> the symbolism uh as you said andrew was not the motivation in uh buying the school bus it wasn't anything to like stunt on all my school mates um or anything like that it was more so just because it was a larger vehicle and I guess it was a bit symbolism, but symbolism more for myself to be like, hey, I have a school bus now. Who, who else has a school bus? What the heck? Who else is doing van life in the school bus? Um, and I bought a short bus specifically because you don't need a special license to drive a short bus compared to a longer bus. And also, I'm going to keep the color yellow. This is a fun fact because I'm a teenager driving this thing around. 
And so what people are going to do when they see this big yellow school bus is they're going to get right the heck out of the way. They're going to be like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to mess with that. One, because there might, <laughs> might be kids inside and I don't want to get sued by the school. And two, because I'm not trying to get destroyed by a school bus. Um, so that, that was another intent in buying it. Um, but yeah, that, that was kind of my motivation behind buying the school bus. I'm curious. Um, I, I know you guys uh, were talking about in one of the episodes about how you wanted to kind of cut down on financials and focus more of your money on like dualistic unity. And I was wondering, and I wanted to, I was thinking about suggesting this to you guys uh, when I was listening to that episode a week ago, possibly doing van life or bus life to, uh, I don't know, possibility for you guys. <laughs> it might, that might be a stretch, but who knows? What, what, what would you guys think of that? Oh, I, I think I'm I'm well beyond that point now, just because I have a wife and a 15 year old daughter, and that would be really inconvenient. But when my daughter yeah. moves out, on the other hand, totally totally possible because I'm once again going to be you know, free, as it were, to just be myself and not have to be responsible for somebody else's life. And so it changes the landscape quite a bit. I've been on this path of fatherhood now for a decade and a half. But before then, yeah, I was very much the kind of person who would just pick up and and not even with a van, it would just be a backpack and a thumb. Like I, I was pretty bad for that kind of thing. But uh, Andrew, Andrew, on the other hand, he, he's got lots of time ahead of him for sure. But one day, I do, I do look towards uh, land, opening up international retreats, opening up centers where we can actually start dealing with uh, some of the homeless problems, some of the opiate problems. Where, like, there, there's so much that I want to do that at this point in my life has less to do with traveling and adventure and more to do with all of the lessons that I learned from my previous travels and adventure. So I'm in a different part of the journey at the moment. It's going to change within 10 years again. But uh, yeah, I, I think Andrew is m- much more likely to be the adventurer. Yeah. Yeah, sooner rather than later. Not specifically van life, but traveling for sure. I'm actually moving. Uh, this is my last night in New York City. I've been here for four years um, and I'm moving to Costa Rica next week. Uh, so going to be there for five weeks and then to Vancouver Island for dual security retreat and then uh, out to Utah for a couple months this winter and then probably do some traveling within the U S and then go abroad, uh, later next year and, and figure out with our next year's retreats, kind of do that sort of scheduling. But yeah, no, I've, uh, I've been in New York for a while now and I, I make time to travel. Like I still travel a decent amount, but it's going to be, I'm not going to hold down an apartment for the next probably year, at least if not longer, it'll be all short term stuff. So I'm very excited because it's kind of all the things I was, I was saying for you, the perfect storm of recognizing a lot of this stuff, being relatively free to do what you want, living in a bus, having the platforms to share things like that's the same sort of stuff I'm feeling right now. And, you know, I got the, uh, the full-time job still going, but you know, once that's done, which probably won't be too many more months, there'll be, you know, it'll be full energy into sharing, expressing, interacting with people, having this conversation just on as many different avenues and and platforms as I possibly can and, you know, enjoying it as I go traveling. I've wanted to travel for a while now. I, I want to see the whole world pretty much in the next couple of years, at least, or as much as I possibly can. And so, yeah, it's literally starting for me like after this podcast episode practically is, is when things are about to start to, to get going. So yeah, I'm excited, but van life could be a thing. I may uh, do some road tripping this winter and early next year, uh, not in a van, but in, just in a car around mostly probably the Western part of the U S but um, yeah, van life is definitely interesting to me. And, and, but for now it's just going to be more formal traveling. Yeah. And it's important to do all of that, regardless of how you do it. doesn't matter if, you, if you're hitchhiking, though I don't recommend hitchhiking anymore. It's a different world now. Just keep that in mind. If it's something you've been wondering about, don't hitchhike. If you can avoid it, there, there are plenty of other ways to travel. Uh, you can find somebody to share a ride with. You, you can you know, go online and find a carpool or, or possibly somebody who's, who's chartered a bus or something. There's a lot of different ways to travel, but do it while you can. Just get out. 
doesn't matter where you're going, just get out and experience something else. I had somebody contact me recently and they were asking me, uh, what do I do about my health? Because I'm in poor health pretty consistently and I'm not sure what to do about it. I can't seem to change my attitude about it. And so I recommended they move. And the reason I recommended they move is because it changes your environment so radically that it actually distracts you from the narrative you're used to telling yourself. You actually have to get used to an entirely new area. You have to get used to an entirely new routine, entirely new people. And because of that, you don't tend to think so much about your health problems. It's not that they're not there, but they're no longer the dominant concern because you have all of this uncertainty to draw your attention to it, right? So this is where moving and, and traveling and meeting new people is huge when it comes to expanding your repertoire of experiences and the number of uh, situations that you can look back at and pull information from because every situation has just a myriad of insights you could pull from it depending on the mentality you're in when you look back at it. Right. So no situation is just what it was. There's so much more there, depending who you are at the time that you're looking at it. And so, yeah, get out there, do as much as you can experience everything you can. And it doesn't matter how you do it. Just try to be safe if you can. But that said, embrace the risk as well. There is no certainty. There's always going to be something you don't see coming. And as long as you know, you can roll with it and you're good to go. And I would say that Spencer has that in spades when it comes down to it, because he knows there's no certainty. He's willing to embrace it at 17 years old. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's not going to go through some hardship on the way, but as long as he can just remember he's been through hardship before, it's not going to stop him. He's just going to be able to keep going. So I guess my question is, what's on your bucket list, as it were, for right now? What is it that you would really like to do? I mean, aside from come to our retreat, obviously. That was a good add-on there, Ray. I, um, I, I don't think you understand how much I want to come to the retreat. There's like... Uh, if, if I could, I 100,000 million percent would, but um, it's, it's a bit too far for me right now. So I'll have to wait until the next one. Um, but yeah, what's on my bucket list right now is three main things. I don't want to list my entire bucket list or we'll be here all afternoon, but um, it's mainly just, mainly just to get on this bus. That's the first thing. Second thing is I want to uh, perfect my diet. Um, that's an important thing for me because I think diet is the biggest lever in health there is besides sleep, of course. And if I'm not, if I don't have a good diet, then I can't like think well and do all the things I need to do and whatnot. So yeah, those two things. Uh, but let me give the more interesting bucket list items. Um, I'd like to start a bison farm at some point, like just have like a bunch of bison and then like adopt like 30 kids. And then we, they can all like throw axes and the school curriculum will be ax throwing, uh, ancient philosophy. And then we'll also learn about nothing to do with anything to do with the news or that, that, that will be a, that will be banned from the school curriculum and anything to do with, uh, I don't know. I was trying to make a good joke there, but I feel miserably. I found it funny. All good. Absolutely. I, yeah, I enjoyed <laughs> I, I enjoy the idea of a, of a bison farm, especially because uh, I lived in Alberta for, for quite some time and I actually had a chance to visit a bison farm in Alberta. They're, they're beautiful. They're fantastic. Why bison? I'm just, I just out of curiosity. They taste good, man. They taste good. They, uh, they taste wonderful and they taste especially better when you raise them right. And don't raise them on corn feed and make sure to rotate them and uh, put them in a good pasture and all those things. So that's another important thing to me is my food not being traumatized. And so I kind of like want to give that back to the environment at some point and start a regenerative farm. I don't know if you guys know what that is, regenerative agriculture, but I supposedly, supposedly, and this is the interesting part about it. It's actually more uh, supposedly more environmentally friendly than crops. <laughs> like it's it's negative carbon emissions. Um, I don't know if that's one hundred percent true. I'd like to look into it more, but um, that's another reason I want to start that. And because we we need meat desperately, desperately, and with all this veganism and vegetarian wave uh, ru ruining our nutrition and 
I think it's just important to revolutionize what we eat and not be fed processed sugars and seed oils and all these things in the grocery store that are ruining our health. So I guess that's another thing that you could say I make content around. You know, you could say I am a self-improvement philosophy influencer, but I also really enjoy talking about health and the things that come with it. So that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, it's all symbolic, right? We're taking care of our mind. We have to take care of our body eventually. Uh, that took me a little longer than most to come to because I spent so long not taking care of my body that I, I literally took refuge in my mind until I could find that balance. And then I started taking care of my body. But um, it's interesting what you were saying about regenerative agriculture. And you're right. It is very effective for car for capturing carbon this is something that uh if anybody who's listening to this if you'd like to get more information i do recommend the documentary kiss the ground uh starring woody harrelson you will find it on netflix it's very informative and it's inspiring it definitely does discuss some positive change that is available to us right now in terms of climate change and greenhouse gas emissions and whatnot and oddly enough it's just stop tilling the soil because you don't need to till the soil constantly, but because of our capitalistic uh, mentality, because of the way our culture runs, because we have such defined preferences in terms of like refined sugars and refined additives and everything else, our, our, our diet's way out of whack, but permaculture, regenerative, uh, regenerative farming, all of this is kind of just going back to the way nature was intended to be. I mean, uh, the indigenous tribes here in British Columbia well, so they ended up finding this, finding this under the water off the coast. Basically, there were shelves and shelves and shelves of man-made of man-made oyster beds. And these were from like over a thousand years ago. And it's because the tribes had figured out how to grow, how to grow oysters and had carved these shelves under the water to make it an oyster farm. And it still exists. It's still there, despite the fact that nobody uses it. And that's what we mean is finding that balance. You don't have to go out and create a warehouse where you're you know, you know, growing oysters artificially. You can actually use nature the way it was meant to be used. You can just augment the intelligence that's already behind it. And the same is true for regenerative agriculture. Hemp is the biggest one there in terms of pulling carbon out of the air because it has so much benefit in terms of the soil. It, it fights off pests. It captures carbon out of the air and immediately sinks it back into the ground. But that's an over, overly simplistic argument as well, because the problem is, say you plant a, a field full of hemp and that year while it's growing, it's capturing all that carbon out of the air and it's putting it in the ground. And what I mean by putting it into the ground is that it's forming roots. Roots are carbon. So all we're doing is taking the carbon out of the air and forming it into a root system for that plant. So what happens the next year when you come over and, and you crop out all of that hemp, all of that carbon that was sequestered in the ground is now released again. And this is what happens each and every year around harvest time. As soon as, as, soon as the agricultural committees or the agricultural industry starts tilling the ground, you can actually see an overhead map of all the CO2 across the world just plume. It's huge and it's all just from tilling the ground. So we have to get away from that in order to let the carbon stay where it's supposed to be underneath us. Right. And it's just it's just coming to that. So I, I love your incentive I, or rather I love your intention because I share your intention. I want to do the same thing. Somebody asked me recently, why do you want a, a chunk of land? Isn't that ownership? And the way I look at it is, no, it's the system looks at it that way. But I look at it as a chance to take care of a piece of the environment, as a chance to protect it from the rest of our capitalistic vision, as a chance to get to know it, to be a part of it. So to me, it's a different intention entirely. And it, it really is about being one with the soil. So I appreciate where you're going in that direction. I share some of that dream for sure, Spencer. That's awesome. I think we have a lot in common. <laughs> I uh, relate to a lot of the things you say about um, letting go of capitalism and the other forms of government and economics. Um, and I think all of the things we're talking about, all of these uh, all of the philosophical ideals, self-improvement tactics, um, I think they all root back to our ancestral selves. I don't, I don't know if you relate, if you uh, can relate to this, Ray, but and Andrew, but in my experience, any self-improvement tactic you can think of, 
is simply trying to simulate the person you uh, you could have been had you been born in the wild running barefoot around with barely any clothes on. And we do this by, you know, grounding. That's a self-improvement tactic. We didn't wear shoes back in the day. Uh, let me think of another example. Uh, weightlifting, just being active in general. We weren't uh, 80% in, indoors and sedentary. We, we were on our feet 80% of the day, out in the sun 80% of the day. And so people will say, oh, you need to get more sun. You need to eat more healthy. And that's another thing. You won't find a package of Oreos in the forest. It's like <laughs> all the things that we're trying to do to improve ourselves deep down is just going back to nature. And it's, it's kind of sad, honestly, how we've become so egotistical towards uh, nature to the point where some people don't even know that humans are animals. That, and we're so disconnected to the point where we have such an unhealthy, just stressed society. And I don't know, that's, that's something that's really important to me and something I venture to making change in the world. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we are nature, right? And so it's, yeah, with our society, it's just become so separate. And you can tell very easily because people don't think of humans as nature. They think of us as something completely separate. And so we take all of the ideas, all the concepts, all the stories that we tell ourselves to be the truth because we don't see the connection there. We've gone so far from it. And we think, you know, the way our society is, not everyone, but a lot of people think it's that's the way it is. It's just like, oh, society just is this way. And it's almost like they think it's always been this way to a degree. Obviously, it's it's clear that it hasn't, but people think that it has. And so we get confused as to why shit's starting to hit the fan and there's health epidemics and all different. There's like a hundred different epidemics happening. And, and I think a lot of it, like you said, Spencer is rooted in the belief that we're something separate, that we're inherently divided, that we aren't what is that we didn't come from the earth that we came from some other whether it be you know heaven or some intergalactic realm or whatever other bullshit people want to make up like no we just can't we are the earth and so it makes sense when you when you peel back all the extra stuff that we've tried to create to almost recreate a nature-like environment that and yet we're still just getting further and further from it. And if we were to just like take a second, look around, we'd see all of the opportunities that we have to heal ourselves, to, to make shifts, to make change. And it's all around us all the time. And we're just too caught up in our idea of ourselves for the most part to recognize it, to notice it. And going back to what you guys were talking about before with regenerative farming, um, I don't know a ton about that. I don't know if that's specifically what you were explaining before Ray, if that's what it was, or if there's like a specific definition, I've heard the term before, but I'm not super familiar with it. And just for any listeners who may not be super familiar with it, um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that from either of you, I guess. Sure. I'll, I'll weigh in on it quickly because it was actually a part of my job for the last two years was talking to people in terms of, of regenerative farming and, and, uh, planning out GIS and maps and overlays and things like that. But what's interesting about regenerative farming is that the word regenerative actually implies the soil. It's the soil that we're regenerating because the way that soil is treated currently is depleting the nutrients in the soil more and more every year. So I think it was in the thirties in the States, you had uh, the dust bowl. I don't know if you've ever heard about that, but the soil became so dry and so bad in the States that there was a dust bowl, like it covered states. It was huge. There was just dust in the air because of all the soil that had dried out and it's, and the crops were dying because this was just after the depression. So there was a lot of concern. And so they changed their, their agricultural processes. They started using more fertilizers, started using more water. They started tapping into aquifers and, and stuff like that. But the problem is, is that the more you use land year after year after year, the less that land has a chance to heal. So back in the 40s or in the 50s, if you were to go to a farm when they were tilling the soil, you would see 
worms and bugs and all of this stuff in the ground. And you knew that because there were birds everywhere. Whenever you tilled the soil on a farm, the birds would come out of, out of everywhere because you had just brought up all the bugs for them to eat. If you go to a modern farm now and you watch them till the soil, you will see almost no birds. And the reason is because there's no bugs because the soil is dead and it's being buoyed with fertilizers. It's being buoyed with Roundup. Like it's, it's being buoyed by these agricultural companies that own the patents to certain seeds that will grow in dead soil because they've been genetically modified so long as you continue to use their products. And that is destined to take us to another dust bowl. This is going to result in us having less and less food year after year after year. We're already seeing less and less, and less varieties of food. Most of the corn industry, for example, uses the same strain of corn. Whereas once upon a time, there were hundreds of different types of corn in the world. And so this is the problem. And so regenerative agriculture isn't just about putting the carbon back in the soil. It's also about diversifying the crop. So instead of just growing corn on one field, you would actually grow a number of plants that complement one another. And this is where it goes back to permaculture as well. Permaculture is another uh, area of research where you're finding out which plants will provide nutrients to other plants. So it's actually a succession of nutrients traveling from one plant to another plant, to another plant, to another plant. So it's, it's actually a process that you study and you, and you recognize, and then you plan your, your, uh, your farm accordingly. So a permaculture farm or a regenerative farm is very rarely going to be one crop and one crop alone. More often than not, it's going to be 10 or 20 different varieties of plant. And all of those plants work together to not only feed one another, but to regenerate the soil for more long-term harvest. But you'll notice the difference on those farms. Very rarely will you see dirt. I don't know if either of you have been to an actual farm, but more, more often than not, if you're going around the crops, it's on, it's on dirt, it's all been tilled. Whereas a permaculture farm, it's mostly grass. You'll see trees, you'll see ferns and stuff. Like it's just growing. It's not nearly as controlled. It's not nearly as sterile as we're used to looking at in terms of agriculture, because it's going back to what we used to do with the land, which was to encourage it, to use it, to work with it, not just to put it in a box and say, grow for me, damn it. And if you don't, I'm going to feed you all this chemical, because that's, that's the mentality we're in. We're looking for the simplest, shortest solution so we can get it onto the table, making us money instead of looking at the nutrients, the way it was grown, the amount of energy that, that goes into it becoming a plant, even you know, how natural that plant is. Because the thing about permaculture, again, is that you're making the most of the nutrients in the soil, you're making mo the most of the land. So you're not applying a lot of fertilizer, you're not applying any of these chemicals. So you really are getting what the plant was meant to be, as opposed to going to a grocery store, buying GMO strawberries, biting into it and feeling like you didn't bite anything but it was strawberry shaped and that's often that's the biggest difference regenerative farming or regenerative agriculture is meant to regenerate the soil to put the carbon back where it, where it belongs and to help the plants grow and help one another so it's just a more holistic way of farming it's just that it's not beneficial to capitalism it doesn't focus on you know get that get get that production out as quickly as possible it really is about the quality of the food and the quality of our lives Wow. I, I just have to say, you know a lot more about regenerative agriculture than I do, Ray. So I'll have to pick your brain a bit more on that. Um, and I just love how much you highlighted the problems with monocrop farming and how monocrop farming is actually killing more animals than regular livestock. You know, we're like, we're saying, oh, save the animals, be vegan, be vegetarian, when in fact, the food you're eating, <laughs> the, the, the land is growing on is sprayed with these pesticides and chemicals and everything else. And it's killing billions of gophers and bugs and all these other animals. But oh, no, those don't matter. The big livestock, that's what we need to focus on because that's what we see. That's what um, isn't underneath the soil. And we're looking at the animals up, up above and we're like, oh, dude, these poor animals, we got to save them. When in fact, you're just killing more animals by not eating them, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely makes sense. I mean, there's nothing I have found funnier than watching a vegan 
sip a glass of wine telling me how their diet is better for animals. Well, I know that a major part of running a vineyard is shooting the deer that tend to infiltrate that vineyard. So how kind to animals are you being while you sip your wine, Mr. Vegan? It's just short-sightedness. It's always just about how it defines us, right? And so it's important to have, have that understanding that more, more often than not, you're really not talking about logic. You're really not talking about clear-headedness or, or even being reasonable. You're just talking about how people define themselves. And that's what you're arguing against. Whereas if you can get past that, then you can have a degree of clarity, but that is the whole journey. Absolutely. Um, on that note, I just want to mention that we are coming up to the two hour mark. We have had a few technical difficulties in recording this episode. So I do appreciate the patience of our listener and of course of our guest. Um, we are going to wrap up the episode shortly here. I'm going to pass it back to Andrew quickly, but I want to say again, Spencer, it's an inspiration talking to you. It's really exciting to see somebody your age going through what you're going through with such a big journey ahead of you, but the clear headedness that you've already managed to find just in being self responsible, just in being willing to see what's next. It's beautiful, man. It's exactly what we want to see in the world. And so I really appreciate you joining us for today's episode. And I'm going to pass it back to Andrew. Absolutely. First of all, Spencer, love talking to you, man. Love your content, love your journey. Excited to see where it all continues to take you. And, you know, you got an awesome head on your shoulders. You clearly get this stuff pretty, pretty damn clearly for, especially for someone who's still going to be a teenager for another two years, like, holy fucking shit, dude. But, um, yeah. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on and yeah, I'm, I'm again, just looking forward to keeping in touch with you and, and seeing where everything takes you. Um, going back to the, the symbolism of the vegan telling you to, to, be nicer to animals while they sip their wine. I find that that symbolism is so relevant to probably like a thousand things in our society. And it all comes down to people not being willing to take responsibility, to look within, to question their reality because they get comfortable. They're like, oh, you know, I love animals, so I'm just going to do this. And it's like, they're not even willing to look one layer deeper and to look into maybe there's some other fucked up shit. And there's so much fucked up shit that it's hard to even get to all of it. It's almost hard to even be mindful of all of it because it's so fucked. And the, the manipulation, not to get too, you know, into conspiracy stuff towards the end of this episode, but we'll get to it at some point. But there's so much shit out there that people just... It's almost pushed that if you do question it, then you're crazy. And questioning is this crazy thing that people do. It's like, don't question. That makes me uncomfortable because then you're forcing me to question. And I feel comfortable with the way I think things are. I don't care if they're actually that way, but if, if they work for me and, and uh, I can feel better about myself and, and have this positive idea of myself as someone who is this way and, and I don't just feel good. Like, Oh man, that's all, that's all they need. And then they're done questioning. And so the importance of questioning, I can't stress enough. It's probably the most important thing to do because anytime you settle on an answer, it's never there. It's always a false sense of certainty. It's always this desire to make yourself feel more comfortable, but there are very few, if any answers. So if you think you have one, question that too. And yeah, but the symbolism of, of some of those examples with how deep some of this shit goes, I'm excited in future episodes to get into some of that, that deeper man behind the curtain, what the fuck is really going on here type stuff, because yeah, it's exciting. And it's kind of scary, honestly, when you start to see things for how they are, but it'll definitely light a fire under you. That's for sure. Absolutely. For anybody with eyes wide open, seeing the world for what it is, is certainly a motivating factor when it comes to empathy. You can understand the machine as it's running and that it has very little consideration for us as biological things that have to live within it. So it, it does definitely motivate you once you start to see it. But on the other hand, it can also disempower you. It can also disempower you to see how big the machine is and how long it's been in power and how well it's been formed over time. And I, and I don't mean well formed as if it's as though it's well designed, but 
it's just been around for so long that it's it's pretty sturdy, uh, not as sturdy as it would like to believe, however. So on that note, we are going to end this episode here. I do find it really funny that Spencer has bought a school bus because the adventures that he's going to go on with it are really the only school we need. That's the true education. And so I just want to wish you happy adventures, Spencer. We really appreciate you joining us. And of course, to our guest or to our listener today, I just want to say thank you for tuning into this episode. We appreciate your patience. We will see you again next week for episode 15. And if you can, do join us for the free group chat. See you soon. Bye, everyone.